All right, lecture two, continuing on. Mendel, through his research with garden peas, gave us two laws or rules. And one is the law of segregation. And the law of segregation tells us, and ignore this Roman numeral one, <clears throat> excuse me, the law of segregation tells us that with diploid organisms, they inherit a pair of genes for each trait. And then when they get ready to reproduce, during meiosis, their gametes end up with only one of the, in the genes. So uh, with this example, it's big Y, little Y, let's say that's yellow, yellow versus green, for example. Yellow being completely dominant over green, so that the big Y represents the uh, yellow and the little Y, the green alleles. And so this is a diploid parent. It has two alleles. When it goes through meiosis, remember we go from diploid to haploid, so half of the gametes get the big Y, half get the little Y. That's what the law of segregation is all about. The law of independent assortment, or the rule of independent assortment. Each gene pair tends to assort independently, okay? And this relates all to meiosis. And look at this. So we have our diploid parent cell, our primary, let's make it a primary spermatocyte, okay? And it's got two long and two short chromosomes, one of the long from mom, one from dad, one of the short from mom, one of the short from dad. So when these line up, they can line up with the dad, <coughs> both of the dads, oh no, let me fix this. Okay, it's, it's fixed. Let me fix this too. I'm fixing my, uh, I'm keep trying to keep up with the time on each of these. But anyway, it can line up this way. But there's nothing that says that the chromosomes from dad all have to go to one of the secondary spermatocytes. And that the chromosomes from mom, all of them have to go to the other secondary spermatocytes. Instead, independent assortment tells us that when these line up during metaphase one, they can be, they and they are randomly assorted. Now we never have two, a one line up with a three. The two ones line up, the two twos line up for humans and then down to the two twenty twos. And think about that. If this is random, what is the possibility that 22 going down the side would all be from dad, okay? And 22 going down this side would all be from mom. It's not very likely. Somebody who's good with probability could probably look up what the actual probability would be of that happening. So these assort independently if they are on different chromosomes. The only time that alleles go together is if they're in the same boat. So any of the genes that are on this long chromosome, for example, do tend to go together because they're in the same boat. They're not in this boat. Or if it was us, the number 15 boat or the number 22 boat. Do you see what I'm saying? So that uh, if they are on the same chromosome, except for the impacts of crossing over, they should go together. All right, so that's the law of independent assortment. If you look in your textbook, you can see that there are some modernized versions of Mendel's concepts. Again, concepts, laws, or rules, okay? 
and uh, alternative versions of genes, we call them alleles, cause variation in inherited traits. Offspring inherit one copy of a gene, so one allele, from each of the parents. An allele is dominant if it has exclusive control over the phen phenotype, like tall being completely dominant over short. So we only see two phenotypes, tall and short, and homozygous dominant, or big T, big T, and, homo and heterozygous, or big T, little t, yield tall plants. Okay, the law of segregation, that these uh, alleles separate into gametes, and that gametes fuse without regard to the alleles they carry. That, too, would be random, somewhat random. Now, when I go to the board, we're going to look at monohybrid crosses using, or, yes, using complete dominance. But we are also, and we'll get to that in a second, going to do incomplete dominance, codominance, and when we get to human genetics, autosomal dominant inheritance, autosomal recessive inheritance, and sex-linked inheritance. So we're going to have quite a few versions of the monohybrid cross. And I'll explain this more, but notice it's just one trait. It's plants, the, tr the trait or character is the co flower color. In this case, it's purple. Both parents are purple. Both parents are heterozygous. So half of the male's pollen will have the big B, half will have the little B. With the female, half of the eggs will have the big B, half will have the little B. Okay, that's the law of segregation. Then with fertilization, if this, if this allele, if the gamete carrying this allele is, fertilizes the gamete carrying this allele, then the diploid organism, the genotype, is big B, big B, and it's purple. Look at these. This is little B, no, excuse me, big B, little B from the male, big B from the female, and we get a heterozygote, also purple. I don't, oh, I think they don't use the uh, P's because it's harder to tell a, uh, an uppercase P from a lowercase P. Then the gamete from the male with the big B, fertilizing the gamete from the female, the egg, with the little B, another heterozygote. And then finally, if the two little B's get together for the zygote, we have the homozygous recessive. And this, this gives us a probability to work with. We'll talk about that later. <clears throat> we will also do a dihybrid cross. And a dihybrid cross is more complex. Notice, not four squares, 16 of them. Notice, not one allele, but two. And they're different, okay? That is because we are looking at two traits. This is where Mendel, working like this, he came up with that idea of independent assortment, okay? So we're going to work with a dihybrid cross. Now, I promise you that for our dihybrid cross, we will only use complete dominance. We will not be concerned with incomplete dominance or co-dominance, and we won't do any human genetics f with and looking at dihybrid crosses. Okay. But here's the thing, not everything is as simple as what I've said. And some of you ask about pleiotropy, for example. Pleiotropy is when a single gene impacts multiple traits. An example is hemoglobin S. Okay, it's a single, in fact, it's an allele of that gene. Hemoglobin S. Hemoglobin S has 
two impacts on the physiology of humans. One, it can either cause the person to have sickle cell trait, which means they can have a sickle cell crisis if they go really high up in a mountain, if they really exert themselves. Okay, so those people are heterozygous. They have hemoglobin A and hemoglobin S. People who have just hemoglobin S have sickle cell anemia. So we've got sickle cell trait and sickle cell anemia. Now those go together. What is separate is that what the second effect on the individual's phenotype is that people who are heterozygous, who have hemoglobin A and hemoglobin S, are more likely to survive malaria. So two phenotypes, the type of the hemoglobin makeup and the other phenotype, the uh, ability to survive malaria. Okay, you could probably look online for other uh, examples of pleiotropy if you're interested. Another variation on this theme is epistasis. And we have two alleles of a gene that mask the alleles of another gene so that, and this would show up in a dihybrid cross. We're not going to do it, but it would show up in a dihybrid cross. An example would be these dogs, pulleys. And it usually, if you have a white dog, it has a pink nose and pink or pinkish nose and a pink and pinkish paw pads. That's what you would expect. And with a dark dog, you would expect dark nose and dark paw pads. Notice this is a white dog with a dark nose. We can't see the paw pads, but they're dark too. So we have the gene for hair color and we have the gene for the color of the skin, more or less. Um, the, the nose and the paw pads, or that at least that part of the skin. And the one of those impacts the other and we end up with a phenotype that we don't expect. Another example of epistasis is with the color, the three main colors of Labrador Retrievers. There's black and there's yellow, but there's also the chocolate lab. If you are interested in that because you like Labrador Retrievers, well, look it up. You, you can find some really interesting information about them. Multigenic inheritance or continuous variation. Here, multiple genes impact a given phenotype. Remember I said that Mendel's pea plants are tall or short? This has to do with hormones and that has to do with the genes. Um, so the, there are two versions. That's complete dominance. And that, that implies there's only one gene for height. But in humans, we come in all different heights. And if we went out and stood, we took a bunch of people and we stood together and someone took a drone and took a picture and we had the shortest people here and the tallest people here, we would see something that looked like an, uh, a bell-shaped curve. When we see bell-shaped curves, when we see that there are not just two phenotypes, we don't just have tall and short humans, that tells us that we are looking at most likely continuous variation or multigenic inheritance. Just two words for the same particular um, phenomenon. Eye color in humans. Weight. But notice too, someone asked about the environmental impacts that some phenotypes 
are impacted by the environment and genes? Yes, our weight is. Because we could genetically be programmed to be a, a, a certain weight, but if we eat too much, we are heavier than that weight. Or if we don't eat enough, we're lighter than that weight. Or even with height, uh, if children don't get enough zinc when they're developing, they won't be as tall as they were genetically programmed to be. So, in addition to all these multiple genes being involved, the environment is involved. Environment can be in, involved in tall and short pea plants because you can give them hormones and you can take those that are little t, little t, that are supposed to be short and you can make them tall. So there. Okay, I need to stop and start over again. So end of lecture two, going to lecture three.